Hello, welcome back. The topic of this video is CT, computed tomography. So that allows one to essentially look inside the body to see a 3D section through the body, as you probably know. A very important modality, and it's difficult to do it justice in a short video like this, but uh, let me try. Let me give you a little bit of history. The mathematics behind this dates way back to the early 20th century. Uh, there's a uh, tra mathematical transform called the radon transform that underlies uh, it's the reconstruction of a CT image. Um, but the more modern uh, sort of incarnation of this is attributed to Sir Godfrey Hounsfield in uh, the UK, who uh, working through, funded through EMI Research, that's the company that uh, actually had the Beatles records. <laughs> The, 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 the CT was developed under that umbrella, and it was um, first used in 1971 to image patients and soon uh, was worldwide. The first scanner installed in the U.S. shortly after in the Mayo Clinic. Uh, per, the, the history is quite complex. I'm not going to go totally into it, but there, there was a parallel discovery at the same time Alan Cormick at Tufts. Uh, and actually, Cormac and Hounsfield shared the Nobel Prize in 1979 for this, in Nobel Prize in Medicine. So um, I'm going to go over the basics of this, some of the uh, issues of image quality, how acquisitions are done, and I'm also at the end going to talk about cone beam CT, which is used uh, especially important in the radiotherapy clinic. Okay, here we go. So let me start with the basics of commuted, computed tomography imaging, CT. That's creating images from projection images. The goal is to image what's inside a patient here. So the patient I'm representing is a circle here, and inside it there's something you want to image, and let's say it's a bone right here. I'm drawing this in blue. And you want to make a full three-dimensional image of this geometry. So it starts by acquiring a projection image. So the way you do that is you have a x-ray source up here, and you have an imager down here, and here I'm drawing it in one dimension, but this would be two dimensions stretching in and out of the page, and then you acquire this image. So let me draw what the profile is. So this is a, a profile of the intensity, high intensity at the edge, goes down, and then there's a dip in the middle where there's less uh, intensity because of the absorption in this bone. Now in CT imaging, we do something called back projection. So basically you're gonna start here in the middle or anywhere in the image and you know what the intensity is and you back project it through the image. So if I go here, if I measure low intensity, I back project it up through the image and then I know that somewhere along that line, there the low intensity came uh, from somewhere along that line. Now you can't distinguish from the single projection whether it's a, a full line, like a rod that's relatively low density, or it could be just a single uh, small circle here that's higher density. So you can't distinguish with one projection, but if you take multiple projections, you can decompose it and figure it out. So let me walk through how that works. So I'm gonna break up this patient and represent it as a bunch of voxels, volume imaging pixels, and the goal is to determine the absorption in each voxel. So I back project this first image and then we rotate around and then we acquire another image and back project that. Rotate around, another image, back project and, and so on. So, you, you, so rotate, back project, rotate, back project. Each time you're doing a back projection through the volume of interest. And so you can see here as you get more images, more back projections, you get closer to a representation of the actual uh, image inside the patient. So I'm simplifying a little bit here because we don't usually do, use a stop and shoot type approach. It's a continuous motion instead that's acquired as you uh, rotate around the patient. Also, uh, we use an algorithm called filtered back projection. That means you filter the image first with a frequency filter before you do the back projection. And you can show mathematically that if you do that, you get an exact representation. So if I look at the image on the right, uh, it's not quite 
an exact representation of the real geometry in the patient on the left. And part of that is because I'm just using a cartoon here to illustrate. But also, you'll see these kind of streak artifacts, a little star kind of thing on the right. And that's because you don't have very many projections. The more projections you have, the more accurate the representation is. Second thing to note, when it came down to the angle at the bottom, the rays that were going back through the patient were identical to the rays that were uh, when we projected from the top going down. So we went, when we went around half a circle, we actually got all the projection data that we needed. I didn't have to go all the way around. It was redundant information. So if you do the actual math on this, you can show that you need to go around at least 180 degrees plus the fan opening angle of the CT in order to get an accurate reconstruction. But you don't have to go all the way around 360. So in the end, you get an image like this, high quality, grayscale image. Let me talk about what the data in this image means and how it's represented. So here I'm showing this voxelized representation of the patient and I'm drawing in pixel values here. On these images, black is a low density, gray is higher, white is highest. These values are actually mass attenuation coefficients, mu. And let me explain that and motivate why that is. When you acquired an image, you took a projection or a line through this uh, uh, representation. So if you start with I0 and you and the ray comes through here and you have some intensity I leaving, you'll remember the equations for how to describe that. It's the beer lamber law, I over I0 equals E to the minus mu X. In CT, we take the logarithm of the intensity ratios. And if I take the log, then the exponent will come down. So that becomes mu X make that positive and negative over there. And so what it is is a sum, that ray is a sum of, over mu i over all those pixels along that line, right? So the mu i is the linear attenuation coefficient in the pixel i. So there's each pixel i, there's i goes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 through the image, right? So in CT, uh, we don't represent the values as mass attenuation coefficients themselves, those funny numbers, but there's a special number called the Hounsfield unit. It's named after Sir Gadre Hounsfield, who was one of the pioneers in CT. The Hounsfield unit is defined as follows. So it's mu i, the linear attenuation coefficient in the pixel, minus the mu of water, uh, divided by the mu of water, minus the mu of air. And you take that whole quantity times a thousand to give it some reasonable units. This might seem like an arbitrary definition, but it does tie these units to some real physical measure, measured materials, and I'll show you in a minute. Now, one thing you'll notice is mu here, uh, the Hounsfield unit scales linearly with mu. It goes up as mu goes up in a linear fashion. Let's look at some typical values for Hounsfield units. So you'll notice here that water has a Hounsfield unit of zero. You can see that from the definition. If I put water minus water, it's zero on top, right? If we're dealing with air, the linear attenuation coefficient is very close to zero. So you get zero minus water divided by minus water minus zero. That becomes minus one. Minus, so you get minus a thousand here, right? And then it scales up. Bone ranges between roughly 500 and 1,000, soft tissue 40 to 80. Fat, which is less dense, has a lower Hounsfield unit, somewhere between minus 60 to minus 100. And lung is at roughly minus 700 to minus 500. So let's uh, look at an image and just kind of scroll around, just look at some numbers. So I'm here in the lung, I'm reading about minus 650 to minus 700. If you look at my cursor, go over here. I'm gonna. This is air, so that's a minus a thousand approximately. Um, and then let me uh, just kind of change the window level here, so we can see the soft tissue. That so you're not changing the Hounsfield units when you change that window level. You're just changing the display. Here I'm in muscle. I'm getting roughly 15 to 70, depending on where I am. Over here is fat. It's less dense. It's darker on the CT image. So that's minus 120 to maybe minus 80 around here. Let's go over to the bone. 
Outside of the bone, compact bone is maybe up to 870. That's the more dense cortical bone. Then inside, uh, it's lower. You see that, maybe 200 or so. Um, it can go over to the vertebral body. You'll see kind of similar numbers, 220 to 300 or so. Um, I can change the window level again. I get a bone, bone window. There you go. That might be a little bit easier to see the bones and how the CT numbers vary in there. All right. Now, I don't know if you notice this, but as I scroll around, you can actually see not only the Hounsfield units, but also the density grams per cc. So there's a calibration between those two. Here's what this curve looks like. This is something that you measure, the physicist measures. And so you'll take different uh, materials of different known densities and scan them and figure out what the household units are. So you would cover some range here, different values, uh, important value being water, which is one, we know. Uh, and then that gives you this curve, and that's used in your planning system. This is very important because these household units and the densities are used for treatment planning dose calculations. Now I'd like to talk about how CT scans are acquired. So here is the basic geometry. You have the source, the red spot, and the detector, the blue ring down under the patient. The patient slides through. And so uh, the rays will come out from the source to the detector. And here I'm going to draw those. And you can see it's kind of a thin fan of radiation uh, coming out. So it's kind of, this is like this slice. Okay, so, and then this whole thing uh, rotates around the patient. So the source rotates, and in the modern scanners, the detector rotates at the same time. So here's what this might look like. It's a sort of a hole or a donut. We, we call it a bore. And then if you could take the covers off and look inside, you would see this, all the equipment rotating around very quickly and acquiring the scan. So... Uh, the beam is collimated here up near the source to a very thin beam, a fan beam, and that collimation can be adjusted. And then at any given position, then a reconstruction is obtained through a, sort of a slice through the patient at this position, and you get all the anatomy in that slice, as I described before. Now, each of these slices has some finite thickness in the su superior inferior dimension, like I drew here. So that has some thickness S, that's S, the slice thickness, and that can be adjusted in the scanners. Now let's take a look at some more equipment. So here you'll see one of the older scanners. Uh, the x-ray tube is up here at the top, and then below it would be the detectors. And so here's a better picture of the tube. You'll see the collimator here, and then you'll see also the high voltage cables coming in here, that would be the anode and the cathode. And you look down here, you see a closer view of the collimator. So that th creates the slice and that can be adjusted in and out. Now let's take a closer look at this detector here. So it's segmented in these lines. <clears throat> Each one of these is a different element. So you get a line coming down from the source, hits one of these elements, and then you detect the attenuation in that line. But it's also, the, in the newer scanner, segmented in this direction. So you have multiple uh, rows, and these are called multi-slice uh, multi systems. So there's more than one uh, slice in the detector bank. So you get the whole image at once. So there's an advantage to that. You get larger volumes faster. So these can, uh, so the width of this, it can vary in different systems. So you could have four slices, eight, 16, and so on, or even 128, and some are even larger now. Now let's look at how the scan is acquired. So the patient is sitting on this tabletop, and that tabletop moves in through the bore as the tube rotates around, and the data is acquired. So if you look at, at this, then this it actually executes a helical trajectory as viewed from the patient uh, point of view. Okay, so uh, this then is called helical CT. There's another way to do it. You can do slice by slice, but
but most systems now are using helical scanning protocol. So one critical thing is the distance uh, between these spirals. So if I have a tube, starts up here, goes around the loop, and ends here. So that's one rotation of the tube. And the, the table travels a distance d. So the relevant parameter here is called pitch, p. It's the distance d in one rotation divided by s, the slice thickness. So a typical value might be 1. So a uh, distance of 1.5 millimeters, let's say, for a slice thickness of 1.5 millimeters. So you can see that the uh, cartoon I've drawn here, the, the spiral is much too loose, but it's just to illustrate things. Now I'd like to talk about image quality in CT scans. A lot of this is going to follow along from the concepts that we talked about in the last video, 19.1. So if you haven't looked at that, go back and have a look first. Here are two images. The one on the left has more noise than the one on the right, but otherwise they're quite similar. So this is our first parameter to look at in terms of image quality is noise. And it's um, controlled by several variables. One is the collimation of the CT or the slice thickness. It's also affected by the reconstruction algorithm that's used for the CT. Uh, the pitch contributes, the KVP that you run the tube, the time in seconds, and the MA or the current. Now these two, the time and the MA, they combine. So noise is proportional to one over the square root of the MA times the time in seconds. And the reason for that relationship is that the MA times the time is going to um, affect the number of photons coming out. And remember that that affects noise. So let's go back for a minute and just remember what we learned in the last video, 19.1. We looked at the Poisson distribution. We saw that the signal to noise ratio scaled like the square root of the number of photons. Or in other words, the noise as you had fewer photons, the noise got worse by the square root of that value. So maybe when you saw that, it looked a bit theoretical, but here we're going to see the practical application of this. So let's look at a couple of examples, and I'm going to uh, look, show some phantom scans. So here you'll see a phantom scan with, done at three different MA settings. The time for these is the same in each case. And you just see that as the MA is lowered, the noise gets worse, right? So MA, again, controls the current in the tube, which controls the number of photons out. The noise is also affected by slice thickness. Remember that you can have some thickness here in the scan, and that's con you can control how thick the slice is. So here's an example. Uh, these are two different slice thicknesses, and you can see that the thinner slice on the right has a lot more noise. Of course, the advantage of a thinner slice is you get higher resolution, especially in the superior inferior dimension. There are other parameters that affect noise as well, and I'm not going to go into any more in detail, but it really comes down to the fact that the CT reconstructions are really controlled by photon counting noise, so that square root of N dependence. So for example, a KVP dependency you can understand. As you turn the KVP down, there's less penetration to the patient fewer photons out and the noise goes up, right? Okay, so let me talk about the next uh, image quality parameter, which is resolution, spatial resolution. And that's uh, affected by several parameters. So the focal spot size, the detector resolution, the pixel size that you um, reconstruct into. And those parameters you'll remember from the last video we talked about in detail. But there's other ones for CT as well. So the reconstruction filter is one, and the slice thickness is another. Well, let's look at those in a bit more detail. So you remember when I talked about reconstruction, I said one of the main algorithms that we use is back projection, but it's actually filter back projection. So we filter first with the frequency filter, and you can control that filter. So you can either let higher frequencies through or preferentially lower frequencies through, and that's going to affect the spatial resolution of the reconstruction as well. Here's an example of that. 
The left is a standard filter, and the right is a bone filter that's designed to let higher frequencies through. If you look at these line pair objects, you can see the difference. You can distinguish the features with the bone filter on the right, but not on the left if you look closely. This might seem like a subtle difference, but when you're talking about some of this high resolution imaging that's needed in some applications, this is important. Now the images I just showed you were taken at 220 MA. Uh, let's look at what happens if I turn the MA down. You'll see the noise uh, increases like we just talked about. That's not a surprise. But actually the spatial resolution is not affected really. So those two things are kind of decoupled. So you have the MA affecting noise but not spatial resolution which is more affected by those other factors that I talked about. So the next topic we're going to look at is cone beam CT, CBCT. So we'll take this fan beam geometry and just replace it. We have a detector down here now, a 2D detector acquiring radiographs, projection images at a bunch of different angles. Typically we'll get 700 of these images uh, through the course of a scan. Uh, now just like before, this whole thing rotates, the source rotates and the panel rotates and also the couch stays at one position it's not moving like in a helical CT so there are some advantages and also disadvantages to uh, geometry like like this compared to the fan beam so let's look at those so first of all the full volume is acquired in one single rotation around the patient so the one main advantage of that is that it will enable an acquisition on one of these C-arm Linux. The C-arm Linux can rotate around once and by regulation it's limited to a rotation speed of one minute for one rotation. So it's not spinning around and around quickly like a diagnostic fan beam CT like we just looked at. So you have to acquire the whole image in one rotation on a syst if you're going to get a system like this to work. And so that's the clear advantage of cone beam for a system like this. So the other way to say that is it allows imaging on treatment with the patient in position. And that is called image guided radiation therapy, IGRT. And we'll come back to IGRT in a future video in more detail. Now there are some disadvantages to cone beam versus fan beam geometry. The main issue is that the image quality is substantially worse. And that's due in large part to scatter. And you can see that if you look at these two geometries. In the fan beam, there's uh, relatively less scatter because the beam is narrow and less volume of tissue is irradiated. But in the cone beam, there's a large volume being irradiated and much more scatter. You can see that if you go back to the uh, drawing we had in the previous video, you'll see that uh, geometry with more scatter, that's going to give you more of these uh, noise photons, these useless photons at the detector. And they don't contain any information about the, about the anatomy of the patient. They just add to uh, the, the extra noise signal. Another disadvantage is that the patient can move during the scan. Remember that the cone beam acquisition takes a full minute if you go all the way around. And so the patient might move during that time. So here you can see this effect on a phantom study. So here I've acquired these two images on the left in the fan beam geometry and the right with the cone beam geometry. And largely because of the scatter, you see the image quality differences here. Let's talk about some of the artifacts you can see on cone beam CT. And some of these also apply to fan beam CT. On the upper left panel, you'll see this so-called cupping artifact. So, meaning the density in the middle is lower, apparently lower, than the density in the outside. And that's due to the scatter contribution in the cone beam geometry, so the Hounsfield units won't be right. Here you'll see the streaking artifact between high density objects, uh, and that's due to photon starvation at the detector, and it's under responding in the reconstruction. On the lower right, you have these rings. So those are due to a miscalibrated or a not functioning pixel or detector. You can imagine that that would reconstruct to a ring, like it would look like a high density object in the reconstructed image. 
On the lower left here, you have um, artifacts due to motion. So this is a gas bubble that's moving during the scan. Recall again that the scan time is quite long. So you can have motions like, like this. You could have a motion from respiration or the patient might move. Lots of different ways for motion artifacts to come in cone beam CT. All right, so that was your whirlwind tour of CT imaging. And hopefully you understand, you know, the essentials, the very basics now. This is a list of resources for further reading. As you can imagine, it's quite a vast literature around this. So I'm just giving you a few subjective suggestions here. And uh, that concludes the radiographic imaging part of this. And in the next um, couple of videos, we're going to move into other types of imaging. So MR, uh, PET, and, uh, and so on. And these are important to understand in the therapy context as well. Thank you.